Mic check, mic check. All right, there we go, boy, I tell you. Y'all got some good tech folks back there. All right, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate the invite. Uh, and I also am thankful that the elders have allowed me to be here with uh, you all this weekend, especially participating with the SHIELD uh, event. I think that is a valuable, something that's needed in so many different congregations. To focus on young men Amen. and to mature and teach our young men about leadership and what it's all about. And as I told our young men yesterday, men are the bedrock of society. Uh, that's who God created first. That's who God gave the task for establishing the home and taking care of the home and doing the work of the home before the lady even got on the scene. Why? Because he needed to be a protector. He needed to be someone who provides security for his wife, so forth and so on. And we need more strong young men, men of faith, men of character, men of leadership in our society today who are going to rise up and be leaders. And uh, I just think it, it was a, whoever started it, it was a great thing. And I think you all should continue it. We never get frustrated or discouraged because of numbers. Because if you have the opportunity to teach just two men, two young men, how to be men, you've done a good work. Mm -hmm. Also, the ladies with the, sh the sword, the new thing that you all started, that was perfect. My girls, they didn't even want to come to the uh, hotel with me. I'm like, I'm y'all daddy. Y'all going to get y'all bed on there. I'm going to y'all. <laughs> they enjoy it tremendously. So that is something that is, uh, I think, was right on time to come up with that. And so I appreciate that as well. Everybody who was involved uh, in the work uh, this weekend and the work that you all have going on all the time. I want to just try to encourage you this morning with my lesson. We have a work that we must do for the Lord. In the body of Christ, we're called to do many things. We're called to be a light. Being a light means that we have to live in such a way that we can lead people to God and people can look at us and see Christ in us and we glorify and magnify God's name that way. We're called also to uh, be good wives to our husbands. We're called to be good husbands to our wives. We're called to be good parents to our children. Children are called to be obedient and good children to their parents. We're called to carry the gospel to a lost and dying world. People out there are dying and they're losing their soul. And the only people on earth who can save them are you and I. That's it. Angels from heaven are not going to do it. Uh, Jesus is not going to do it. As a matter of fact, the next time they see Jesus is either at death or at his coming. And we pray that they're saved then. We have a lot of responsibilities as Christians. The problem a lot of times in our lives and in the, in the church is that we become distracted by life. By life. Many of us get up every day with good intentions. Many of us get up with good intentions to be a good wife, good intentions to be a good husband, a good parent, a good employee on our job, a good brother and sister in Christ, a good teacher of the gospel to someone who needs it. Many of us get up with good intentions. And the day that we get up with good intentions to do all of those things, boom, some hits us right in the face. Either a letter in the mail of foreclosure on the house. Either a meeting at work with boss who says you just lost your job. A miscarriage in a pregnancy. A death in the family. What I have found in the short time I've been preaching, and I've only been preaching in a short time, 16 years is nothing compared to some of the, the gospel preachers and some of you all who've been a part of the body of Christ for a long time. But in the short time I've been preaching, what I have found, the struggle that I've found in the church is not a knowledge of the gospel. It's not knowing the plan of salvation. It's not knowing whether or not there's one church. It's not knowing the sin of not worshiping God properly. The struggle that I found in the church 
is people trying to focus on the work of the Lord at the same time trying to battle life's issues. If we cannot focus on God while we are traveling through this life and dealing with life issues, there's no way we can be effective in the work of the Lord. So my question this morning that I want to address is this right here. How does God respond to us in the midst of our struggles? How does he respond to us when we are overtaken by things in life that weigh us down, that make us fall down on bending knees with tears in our eyes and say, Lord, I cannot take it anymore? How does God respond to us? Does he excuse us from our Christian duties? Or does he say it's okay? Take you some time off. I understand. I want to look at four examples this morning. And the first one is going to come from Numbers chapter 11, and this has to do with Moses. And some of the things that I show you this morning, I hope that I can give you some comfort in knowing that you are not the only one. In Numbers chapter 11, Moses was fed up. He was leading a group of stubborn people, people who were unappreciative, people who always complained about everything. Every time they met a, 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 an obstacle in the road, they always looked back to Egypt and said, man, I wish we had stayed in Egypt because Moses has no clue what he's doing. He's led us in the wilderness to die. We were better off in Egypt. And they complained against Moses. And one of these times they complained against Moses in number chapter 11 and verse number 1. We see, now when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, for the Lord heard it, and his anger was aroused. But I want to jump down a little later on in the text in verse 10. Where Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families and everyone at the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was greatly aroused, and Moses also was displeased. And so Moses said to the Lord, why have you afflicted your servant? Now let me stop just for a minute. Moses is questioning God, saying, why have you brought this upon me? It is a natural human reaction when we find ourselves in difficult situations to say, Lord, why? God has never condemned anyone for questioning him. The sin is not in questioning. The sin is in questioning Losing faith and confidence in God and not seeking an answer. But if you can't ask your daddy a question, well, who are you going to turn to? And I don't know about you, but my daddy in heaven, my father in heaven, cares about me. And he wants to hear what's on my mind. Amen. Moses says, why have you afflicted me, God, to go through what I'm going through? And why have I not found favor in your sight that you have laid the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I beget them? That you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a guardian carries a nursing child to the land which you swore to your father? <laughs> Listen to that Moses. Lord, I didn't have these people. These are not my children. <clears throat> they don't belong to me. In the next verse, verse 13, Moses says, Where am I to get meat to give all these people? For they weep all over me, saying, Give us meat that we may eat. I am not able to bear these people alone because the burden is too heavy for me. If you treat me like this, kill me here, kill me now. What if you had a member of the body of Christ say that they no longer want to live? How would you look at them? Strange, crazy, ignorant, ungodly, not me. I would look at him as a human. <clears throat> one of God's greatest soldiers, one of God's meekest men, Moses got to a point in his life where he was distracted. And he says, Lord, I can no longer bear this burden. Kill me here. Kill me now. And I tell you, if the greatest warrior God has ever had to fight for him can be distracted and lose focus, 
and get to the point where the burden of life is too much to carry, then I know I can get there too. How did God respond to Moses? Did God look at Moses and say, that's okay, Moses. You don't have to do it anymore. Just, 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 I, I, I excuse you. Take you some time, my boy. Come here. Lay your head on my shoulder. It's okay. It's okay. Did God do Moses like that? No. Let me show you what God did to Moses in verse 16. So the Lord said to Moses, Gather to me 70 men of the children of Israel, of the elders of Israel, whom you know by the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tabernacle of Medan that they may stand there with you. Then I will come down and to talk with you there, and I will take the spirit that is upon you and put the same spirit upon them. Y'all, let, let me show you how powerful this is. Moses is at his weakest point. He is down on his knees crying to God. He cannot go on with life. He says, God, kill me here and kill me now. Yet God looked at that broken man, that broken man Moses, and God says, I still want the spirit that you have, and I'm going to take the spirit that you have and put it on them. Why? Because, it, let me tell you something, just because you're broken in life, just because you're broken in life, doesn't mean the spirit that you have within you is broken. Moses may have been broken as a human, but God looked at that broken man and said, I still want your spirit because the spirit that's within you is strong. And I'm going to take that spirit and put it upon these men right here, and they're going to stand with you. So what did God tell Moses at the moment in his life when he lost focus? He told Moses this right here. I'll get someone to help you. But you're not quitting. Keep moving. I'll get someone to help you. That's another gentleman I want us to look at in Job chapter 3. Turn your Bibles over there. We all know the story of Job. And I tell you, boy. Uh, you know, we say Job was a man of faith. And Job was a man of faith to a certain extent. But Job's faith was not 100% complete. And I'll tell you why I say that in just a minute. Job lost everything he had. He lost his livelihood. He lost his son. He lost his daughter. And sometimes we look at Job's wife and we say, that woman there, she's lost her mind. She told Job, curse God and die. Well, let me ask you some ladies. What if you had been there at that time, you and your husband, and you lost all your children? What would you do? Hey, dads, those are precious sons that you have, those precious daughters that you have. What if you lost every last one of them at the same time? What would you do? Y'all, I can't even think about it. I try not to think about it. Because that little man right there, even though he has a little whooping every now and then, and those girls over there, I can't even fathom the idea of not having them in my life. And just to think about it makes me want to shed a tear and realize what Job was actually going through. Job had lost focus because of the burdens of life. He was a godly man. He was a blameless man. He feared God, but he lost focus because of the burdens of life. And notice Job's attitude in chapter 3. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. And Job spoke and said, may the day perish on which I was born and the night in which it was said a male child is conceived. May the day be darkness. May God above not seek it, nor the light shine upon it. May darkness and the shadow of death claim it. May a cloud set on it. May the blackness of the day terrify it. And as for the night, may darkness seize it. May it not rejoice among the day of the year. May it not come into the number of the months. And may the night be barren. And may no joyful shout come unto you. Look at verse 11. Why did I not die at birth? Job was basically saying, why was I even born? Now, what if you had a member of the body of Christ today who got fed up with life and got distracted and said, why was I even born? Would you look at them and say, there's something wrong with them? They're crazy. They're ignorant. They're ungodly. Not me, I would look at them and say they're human. 
Job lost focus. But what did God do? Did God look at Job and say, it's okay, boy. Lay your head on my shoulder. It's okay. No, turn to Job chapter 38 and let me show you what God did. Job chapter 38, beginning with verse number 1. God's response to Job in the midst of his pain, in the midst of his distraction, said this right here. Verse number 1, the Lord answered Job out of a whirlwind and said, Who in the world is this who darkens counsel by word without knowledge? Now I add a little bit to it. So don't be talking about Oh, he just messed that up, y'all. I'm trying to talk as if I was there. To, you know, in the country, we say, yeah, we, we, used, we say, what in the world? We say that all the time. Oh, great, day in the morning. The Lord said, out of a world where who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now you prepare yourself like a man, Job, and I will question you, and you will answer me. Where were you when I created the foundations of this earth? What? Job is down on his knees with tears in his eyes. Job is at the point that he hated he was born, and God said, get up, I got a question for you. Where were you when I created this earth? What in the world? Great, there come on. And, and God went on this question spree from chapter 38 all the way to chapter 41 by asking Job all of these questions to which Job did not have an answer. Why did God do that while this man was broken? I can tell you why God did it. Because in the midst of his struggles, when he lost focus on God, God had to get him refocused. And there was no other way to get Job refocused than to get Job to focus on who God was, God's majesty, God's power, and what God was capable of accomplishing. Amen. And you know what? God achieved it. Because when you turn to chapter 42, and this is going to uh, uh, tell you what I meant when I said Job's faith was not 100% faith complete. Notice what we have here. Job chapter 42, beginning verse number 1. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know. Look at it. I know you can do everything. And that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. Job says, I know. Did he not know before? I believe he did. But he knows a different way now. And let me show you. Verse number three, he says, you ask. Who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I will question you, and you shall answer. Now, watch verse 5. Job said, I heard of you by the hearing of the ear. But now my eyes see. You see, Job had faith based upon what he heard from somebody else. And that's the way many of us may be today. We have faith based upon what we hear come from the pulpit of a, or the Bible class. But really, have we gotten in here to see it for ourselves? You see, as long as your faith is built upon what someone tells you, is secondhand faith. And you can be saved by secondhand faith as long as you're not being led by blind teaching. But if you're being led by blind teaching, then that secondhand faith can lead you to destruction. So you can only pray and hope that what you're being taught is the truth. But when you actually take what you have heard and find it in here and study it and understand it for yourself, as it is the truth, then your second-hand faith moves to first-hand faith. And that's really what you become rooted to. Job had heard of God, but you know what? That wasn't good enough for God. God brought Job to a different level. God moved Job from second-hand faith to first-hand faith, and Job said, all of these questions you asked me, Lord, I have never thought about, but I'm thinking about them now, and I've heard about you, but now I see you in my own eyes. You see, Job didn't say, God didn't tell Job you can give up. 
God refocused Job and let Job see how wonderful God was in the midst of his struggles. What about Jesus in Luke chapter 22? Turn over to your Bibles. Did y'all know Jesus did not really want to go to the cross? Jesus didn't wake up and say, man, boy, I'm ready for this. Well, I want to I I be crucified for my people. No, 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 no. Jesus did it because he loved us, not because he wanted to. To me, that makes his sacrifice that more precious in my sight. For someone to do something that they don't really want to do for you, but they do it in a way. That's love, y'all. In Luke chapter 22, Jesus knew what, was, what he was facing in his life. For a moment there, Jesus may have got distracted, may have lost focus. And so he went and prayed to God in heaven in Luke chapter 22 and verse number 28, uh, not, not 28, Luke chapter 22 and verse number 40. We find that he came to a place and he prayed that they may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew himself. In verse 42, notice what he said. He said, Father, if it is your will, take this Come away. He said this three times in other accounts. Three times. God, take it away. I do not want to go through this struggle. God, take it away. I do not want to face this pain. God, take it away. This is too much for me to bear. Does that sound like someone who was anxious about going to their death? No. No. It sounds like someone who loved us so much that in spite of his suffering, he was willing to go anyway. What did God do to him? Did God say, come here, son, it's okay. You don't have to do this. I'll find another way. Take you some time off. Or let me prolong it so you can think about it a little bit. No, he didn't. Let me show you what God did. In verse number 43, the Bible says, then angels appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And he, being in agony, prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he arose from prayer and his disciples had come to him, he, found, uh, he had gone to his disciples, he found them sleeping and so forth and so on and continued his journey. Notice God didn't rescue him. God didn't say it was time to quit. God sent angels down to strengthen him. God sent angels down to strengthen him. You know what that tells us? That tells us that God was not going to let Jesus quit no matter how hard the road was. But what God did is he provided strength for him to continue the work. He provided strength for him to continue the work. What if you had somebody in the body of Christ who said, Lord, I, I, I. I don't want to go through what I got to go through to teach the gospel to somebody. I'm afraid of being, of being rejected. I'm afraid and I'm ashamed to do this. I don't want to do it, Lord. Is there another way? Would you look at them as people who just don't want to do nothing? Cowards. People who cannot add to what we're trying to do in the body of Christ. Not me. I would look at them as humans. Who see something in front that they're a little bit afraid of and they have anxiety about approaching it. And we have to find a way to strengthen them. Mm -hmm. Lastly, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. You all know this man by the name Paul. Paul had a thorn in the flesh. And I love hearing people trying to explain what that is. Don't ask me. I don't know. I don't. Yes, I do. It was thorn in the flesh. <laughs> See? There you go. First one got it right, didn't it? I don't know what it was. All I know is, whatever it was, it affected my Paul so bad, he prayed to God three times that God would take it away. I've read so many interpretations of what people think it is, and some of them good, but we can only guess. We can only guess. But God, Paul prayed three times in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 8. Lord, I pleaded, with, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it should depart from me. Whatever it was, it, uh, it aggravated Paul so much, he prayed three times just like Jesus prayed three times that God would take it away. 
Have you ever prayed for something in your life while you're trying to live for God? Something so drastic in your life that is making you, making you lose focus? You go to sleep praying about it. You wake up praying about it. You go throughout the day praying about it. It doesn't look like any change has come. And it seems like God has not answered your prayer. Maybe God did answer your prayer. Maybe he answered your prayer just like he answered Paul. God told Paul, no, I am not taking it away. And you're not going to stop the work that is meant for you to do. In verse number uh, 9, the, God said to Paul, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Paul, no. No, I'm not going to take it away. I know you are distracted right now. I know that whatever this is, is causing you to lose focus. But you cannot stop the work that I've given you to do because of this thorn in the, this thorn in the flesh. My grace is sufficient, but when you are weak, my strength resides in you. Keep going. God did not give Paul a reason to quit. What if you had somebody in the body of Christ complaining about something going on in their life that they wish would be taken out of the way? Always complaining about that same situation. How would you look at them? Oh, Lord, here he comes again. Here she comes again. I bet it's about her husband. I bet it's about his job. <laughs> there you go again. Let me tell you something, y'all. Let me tell you, we got to be very careful. we got to be very careful about this. What is not a big deal to you may be a big deal to somebody else. And let me tell you why. We're per our personalities are different. Genetically, we are different. You can have two people who lose a mother through death. And one of them never, ever misses a step. And one of them commits suicide. Now, you explain that to me. Well, that person over there, they ain't have no faith. Well, obviously, they didn't have no faith. Duh! The question is not, they didn't have, did they have faith? The question is, why did they have faith? Their personalities are totally different. Genetically, they are different. They were raised different. They have been in different environments. They have been influenced by different things. So it is not for this person here who can handle it to look at this person here and say, oh, my goodness, child, you need to suck, suck it up. No, it's for this person here to do just like 2 Corinthians chapter 1 says, use the comfort that God gave them and come around here and grab this person right here and smother them in the same comfort. And said, get up, let me help you walk. You can't walk, let me carry you. But one thing I'm not going to do is, I'm not going to mock you and I'm not going to leave you behind. Because you happen to be weaker than me. Man, that's what true love is. In the body of Christ. I've been so many places, and it may not be that way here. And I pray it's not, but I've been in so many places where brothers and sisters in Christ look at each other and look at each other's weaknesses. And when we make a mistake, we just continue to kick each other in the ground. Oh, she messed up. And the pain is greater and greater. In conclusion, in our struggle, God never excuses us from carrying out his work. In our struggles, God wants us to stay focused on him. In our struggles, we would either keep moving or we would keep sinking. We would do just like Peter did when God, when Jesus looked at him and said, walk, son, walk. And he got out of that boat and he stepped down on that water and he began to walk and a wave came. He stayed focused on Jesus, so he continued. He began to walk and another wave came. He focused on Jesus, so he continued to move. But those waves kept coming. They got bigger and bigger. The distractions were more and more. Jesus and looked to the right. And looking at Jesus and look to the left, every time he would look away from Jesus, he would sink more and more to the point that he almost drowned. And Jesus reached down and said, O oh, ye of little faith. No matter what the distractions of life are, we cannot lose from being a good husband, from being a good parent, from being a good brother and sister in Christ. Don't let anything in this life distract you. Keep moving. And great will be 
your reward. If you're here today and the distractions of life have caused you to quit moving, to quit being the wife you know you should be, the husband you know you should be, the parent you know you should be, the child you know you should be, the brother or sister in Christ you know you should be, the teacher of the gospel you know you should be, the individual Christian in your community you know you should be. Let us pray for you. We in this together. We not only want to pray for you, we want to pray with you. Because as we travel this journey of life, we travel it side by side. Don't wait till tomorrow, because tomorrow's not promised. If you're here and you're not a child of God and you want to become one, it begins with faith. Faith means that you have accepted in your mind that Jesus is the Christ, that he came and he lived and he died for you, that he was crucified on Calvary's cross, he was buried for three days and three nights, and he was resurrected with all power in his name. And through that power, he has the authority to grant eternal life unto you. If you believe that, then that belief causes you to want to change your life. You don't come to Jesus after you're changed. You come to him and he changes you. If you wait to come to Jesus after you're changed, you will never come. Because you cannot change yourself. That faith causes you to confess his name before this audience and then be baptized in water right now, not next week, not the end of the month. In Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip were traveling. And the Ethiopian eunuch, after he, after he had been taught the gospel, he looked out there and saw some water and he said, can I be baptized in some water? Stop the chariot. And Philip said, well, if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you may. He said, I believe it, I believe it. And they got out right then on the road. And he baptized them. Why? Because it's that important. Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Peter said in Acts 2, 38, that we must repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. And Ananias told Paul in Acts 22, 16, why are you waiting? Why are you tarrying? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sin. Romans 6, verse 3 through 7, Paul talks about baptism being a burial, a death, and a resurrection. And how when we die in baptism, the old man is crucified, we're dead to sin, and we rise a new creation in Christ. If you're here today and you want to become a child of God, don't wait. Because one of the devil's greatest wiles, W-I-L-E-S, is to get you to wait a while, W-H-I-L-E-S. Don't give him that privilege. Whatever your need is, as together we stand and sing, we pray that you come. Go stand.
belong to my heart beyond all measure. I'll turn it over to the elders at this time and let them take over with these precious souls we have here. Thank you all very much. 